Hello, welcome to Airing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, a UK-based charity working to help, support and inform people living with pain and healthcare professionals. This edition has been supported by a grant from the Scottish Government. Opioids are drugs which either come from the opium poppy plant or are chemically related to those made from opium. Stronger opioid drugs include the likes of morphine and fentanyl. Their use, overuse or abuse still creates confusion amongst patients and some health professionals. Dr Cathy Stannard is a consultant in pain medicine at Frenchet Hospital in Bristol. A leading expert in the use of opioids, she was chair of Consensus Group and editor of the British Pain Society guidelines on Opioids for Persistent Pain, Good Practice. In 2013, she gave a lecture to the Society under the heading When the Cure is Worse Than the Disease, Strategies for Safe Opioid Prescribing. What sits behind all that is that, particularly in North America, they have a huge problem with misuse of prescription drugs. And I think that's largely about different choices that drug users make. And, and really the availability of prescription drugs is uh, much easier, for example, than getting hold of heroin in the States. So um, prescription drugs are commonly a drug of abuse. Now this has led to a great deal of public and policy concern about the amount of prescription drugs, I guess, out there in the system. So what's happening is there's been a great move to restrict clinicians or to try and educate clinicians to very much focus who and for how long they target opioid medicines for. Now, I think that's a real public health problem, and I've worked with colleagues in the States, and I think they're tackling it responsibly. But I think what is a risk here is that we are concerned about what essentially are drug misuse practices in the States, and maybe let that influence unduly our decision to treat the patient that's in front of us who actually might benefit from opioids. Now, I think how it gets complicated is that, as many people understand, chronic pain is really difficult to treat. And what we end up doing most of the time is supporting people in their self-management strategies to improve their quality of life. And all the various things that we offer patients in terms of medical interventions are not very helpful. So almost any, any sort of intervention that you think of, whether it's a tablet or whatever, will help about a third of people. Now, that means that even very strong medicines like morphine are not going to help everybody. There are going to be more people they don't help than they do help. And there are quite a lot of side effects of the drug. And I guess that what I'm trying to support is the idea that we don't put people on morphine like drugs and because there's nothing else leave them exposed to all the harms of those drugs but that we assess people and if they're helping and they're helping the drugs are helping them improve quality of life we support them in staying on them but if they're not helping we take them off and I think it's just about trying to target what is quite a strong class of medication with quite a lot of side effects just trying to target it to people who are definitely getting a benefit so is there or was there a danger that if the morphine isn't working now then just up the dose and up the dose and just keep going no and i think it's a very interesting point and i think that's maybe where we've got in a bit of a muddle because the traditional teaching oh decades ago for treating patients with cancer related pain at the end of life is that the correct dose is enough. So if the first dose doesn't work, you double it and double it and double it. Now, that would maybe work well for cancer pain in the short term at the end of life. So this is not for cancer pain with patients who have a long prognosis. It might also work for very short-term pain like post-operative pain. But I think, I mean, I think that's a really important point because what we know from the literature about doses for long-term pain is that there comes a point at not a very high dose where when you put the dose up, you get more harms, but you really don't get any more benefit. So there's a rationale for starting somebody on a drug and, and adjusting it upwards a few times to get to a reasonable dose. But there comes a point when there is not going to be a benefit in taking that drug higher. And I think part of the problem is that people have borrowed from what we know about cancer pain 
and felt that if a drug isn't working, it's because it's not been given in enough dose, and the drug dose goes up and up and up, and eventually the dose gets to an, a level that is just not helpful for people's quality of life, because they can't concentrate, they can't invoke self-management strategies, they have other side effects. I was speaking with somebody a few weeks ago who I suspect is in that situation, and he's desperately trying to reduce his dose to come off the drugs so that he can maintain some quality of life, but balance the pain along with it. Is that usual? I think that is, and I talk a lot to prescribing doctors about this. And actually, I think patients have a much better understanding, because I can have a conversation with a patient about this and they'll get it immediately. And what I might say is that a patient might come to me and they would come to my service because they had pain that was impairing their quality of life. If they come to me with pain and they're on a very high dose of an opioid medication, I say to them, well, it, it's not working because they've got pain. And I point out that if it's not working, they might be better not taking it. So there are sort of two health states. You can have a certain amount of pain and be on a lot of medication, or you could come off the medication and be in the same amount of pain. And actually, as soon as I explain it like that, without exception, patients say, when can I start? How, how can I come off? And I think that's something that we all ought to do as prescribers. If a patient is on a high dose and it's not helping, and this doesn't apply to opioids, it applies to all the other drugs that um, patients take to support their pain management, is to try bringing it off and see what happens. And you might bring it off and find the pain's a lot worse, in which case it has been helping more than you think. But then if your pain doesn't get worse when you come off, it's great because you stay off it and you're freed from all the side effects of that drugs, which in themselves can impair your quality of life. Dr. Cathy Stannard, and we'll be hearing from her a little later in this programme. I'll just remind you that whilst we at Pain Concern believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgment available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Dr Rajesh Muglandi is a consultant in pain medicine in the Cambridge area. He was also a lecturer in the University of Cambridge where he ran a laboratory looking at the mechanisms of chronic pain. So straight to the heart of the matter, what are they? I actually got into my research looking at memory formation. And my initial question of that many years ago was, can you remember under anaesthesia? If you're having an operation, can you form memories? And what we showed is that, in fact, you can, in certain situations, form memories, despite the fact that you're not aware of what's going on. That is called implicit memory formation. Now, the interesting thing is that as soon as I started doing the research, I realised, and because my other interest was pain, that pain is a memory. And it's the same sort of thing that if you, for example, have a really nice meal at a hotel and uh, you the smell of the restaurant, you find that to re-experience that rather nice event, say a few months later, all you need is one smell this, of the smell of the food and that will re-evoke the whole atmosphere. In the same way, chronic pain is, is a memory. It's a circuit that's been set up and it doesn't take much to keep it going. You don't have to have the initial trauma, say it was an accident or an operation. You can have just very light touches that set the whole thing off or a certain movement or a certain, you know, unpleasant experience that you experience emotionally and it will set off the whole pain experience. If you say, does that mean it's not real? The answer is no, it's actually very real because everything in our brain is related to memory. You know, that's our identity. I don't know if you remember seeing Blade Runner and the guy realizes that you know the, the robots all have memories and they they don't know they're robots because the memories have been implanted and then he, he has to think about his own he's sitting there playing the piano you know and uh, looking at all the photographs and it is really quite an important concept that what we're dealing with and what we try and disrupt if we need to is that circuit and there are lots of different ways of disrupting that circuit so I could go to a concert and I could experience a wonderful violinist on page and there'd be somebody coughing next to me, there'd be somebody smelly next to me and I could go home and listen to the CD of that and I'd have a completely different experience or perhaps whenever I listened to that music again I would have the smelly, noisy experience. Absolutely. It's been modified and you can modify it and that's actually a very interesting way that um, you, you may have listened to that symphony in the past and you had a really nice attachment to it 
but then subsequently it's modified. One of the ways of an unpleasant memory being tackled is through the psychological approaches of what you attach to that memory subsequently. And lots of different techniques are called, and some psychologists will be able to talk about this in a better way than I, but you know, for example, a reframing, and you, you put different context around and different meaning to that memory. And it's very clever. I mean, it works for some people and doesn't work at all for others. Other people, you have to just modify with drugs, trying to get rid of the circuit. And other people, of course, what I do is spend my time is finding the triggers. Like we talked about the smell that evokes the restaurant. There are sometimes in the body little triggers that set off the central pain state. And they're called peripheral triggers. Or, and, and the posh word is peripheral maintenance of central sensitization. Something from the periphery feeds in, keeping the whole thing going. And so what we can do, as well as working on the central memory and mo modifying it through, say, psychology, through drugs, you can do something about the peripheral trigger. You can, for example, kill it off, numb it. As I do sometimes, Botox, it take away the muscle spasm. And we know that that is not the whole pain, but that's all you need is to take down the evoking of that memory. Lots of people give the example, and you may have given it as well, that if I stamp on your toe and tell you, oh, by the way, uh, somebody's stolen all your money and your bank has gone bust, you will feel quite a lot of pain. But if I stamp on your toe and I say, oh, and you won the lottery too, the pain might not be so severe. So the pain isn't finite, it's everything else that feeds into it. Absolutely. It's a very, very important point. The context of suffering is very important. If you have a memory of a pain and it's associated with, for example, deeds of valour and you came out of it well, I mean, I, when I treat military guys, this is interesting, the way they stand up to certain pains, because of the context of the pain meant there was meaning to what they did, meaning to the outcome. It doesn't always work, but this is... And it's not meant to sound condemnatory to anybody else, but if you have had that experience, you know, your leg blown off, I've seen people who've, for example, had stepped on mines, had an amputation, still have severe phantom limb pain, but they're now riding horses, running event companies. They have got back to normal life. You see others who've lost the leg in a road traffic accident, deep anger at the drunk driver involved who caused this to happen. And the focus for them very much becomes the court case, the anger at the driver being allowed to go off with a relatively little fine, which often happens, and they've got the pain in the leg still. So you have this awful situation of trying to help them move on from that experience. And of course, that is where reframing that whole experience, trying to get them to come to terms with the pain, is part of the healing process and letting them move on. And people do move on, but sometimes you get stuck and uh, you can get stuck physically because the pain is just too severe to deal with. Because one of the issues is if the pain is that severe, your brain cannot move on. The stump is painful. Every time the stump hurts, it triggers a whole phantom limb experience. It triggers the memory of the accident. And you can't get them to move on and they can't do it for themselves. So this is where lots of interventions in you know, it. Do you numb the end? Do you kill off some nerves? Do you put in a pump in their back? as well as helping them move on with, say, the court case, the medical legal process. All of that needs to end to help them move on with their lives. Otherwise, they're trapped. They're in a prison. Dr Rajesh Muglandi. Well, from the prison of the mind to the physical prison of four walls, locks and keys. We heard Dr Cathy Stannard talking earlier about issues surrounding the use of opioids. At that same British Pain Society annual scientific meeting, she and Dr Ian Brew launched a national guidance for prescribing and non-medical management of chronic pain in secure environments. The new prison guidelines are a project that I've been involved in. I've been interested in it actually for the whole area for about a decade. And what has driven me to want to do something about this is hearing the stories of patients who have got very genuine pain complaints, but who are not believed in prisons and have their pain managed poorly. And I think pain is a chronic pain is a great vulnerability for somebody in a secure environment. Now, one of the problems around all this is that although there are lots of strategies and we, we do not only use medications in pain management, medications do play a part in pain management, but the nature of the medications that we use make them in essence, a tradable commodity within the prison setting where particularly illicit drugs 
um, are now much more difficult to get hold of. So I think hitherto people working in secure environments have been concerned about the overuse of medications because of the risk as well that that poses to the patient in pain for being bullied or coerced and having their medications take, taken away. And I think this has resulted in people probably under-prescribing. And I think also that, as with many um, healthcare systems, there's not always a good understanding about management of persistent pain. And so I think there's quite a learning curve for people working in secure environments to understand about persistent pain, to understand about the causes, what it, you know, how to diagnose it, the effect it has on people's lives. And what the piece of guidance um, is about, it's, it's, a, it's a simple piece of guidance, but it's, a lot of it is about assessment and understanding patient's pain and understanding the influences on the patient's pain. And having made that assessment, we've then tried to talk about appropriate evidence-based treatment pathways. And really what's quite interesting about the project is it's considered a kind of risky context in which to provide pain management services, but I think it's focused everybody very much on thinking about quality and about best practice. And largely the sorts of recommendations we make about pain management in secure environments would really very much stand up for pain management in the community. But I think one thing that I would say that's quite important, because there might be misunderstanding about this, is that some drugs for pain are more popular as a commodity in prison than others. And what we have said in the guidance is if a patient is assessed as having pain, and if a less risky drug is more likely to help, given that not all drugs help, we would always start with the less risky drugs. That's better for the patient because they will not be bullied or coerced for their medication. And we would be choosing that drug not just on the grounds of its tradability, but because we actually think that's the best bet for managing pain. Now, if that doesn't work, we would then move down the list. The drugs down the list may be less good for managing pain, but are also somewhat more risky in that setting. So actually it's turned out in a way, I think quite well, that the less risky drugs are the more effective drugs. And what we hope is we've had a lot of um, contact from groups who've read this guidance who tell us very sad tales about people who've had very poor treatment of pain in prison. But actually I think a good road test is when I plug in all those patient narratives to this piece of guidance. In every case, the patient would have had a much better deal if they'd been managed according to, the, according to this guidance. And I think we've got the policymakers behind us. And one of the things I think is very important is that on reception into prison, patients are given a needs assessment in relation to their health. Um, and a lot of that is often around substance misuse and related disorders, psychiatric disorders. But actually now pain is going to be right there within the first few minutes of assessment, um, asking prisoners if they have pain and then assessing that, evaluating it and moving them on down through an appropriate pain management pathway. So I think it'll take time, but I'm very reassured. I have been going around the country to different groupings of uh, prison health professionals and commissioners of offender health services and that everyone is terribly enthusiastic to take this up really keen soaking it up like a sponge and I think people really want to change things and make things better so I would really hope that the sort of bad stories that we hear now will become much fewer and far between as this becomes much more embedded into regular practice. One of Dr Cathy Stannard's collaborators in those national guidance for prescribing and non-medical management of chronic pain in secure environments was Dr Ian Brew. He's a GP who has been working in prisons since 2001. We've spent the last 10 years mainstreaming prison practice so that prisoners uh, hopefully get primary care equivalent to that that they receive outside, which certainly wasn't always the case. It's a challenging environment. There's lots of learning to do along the way, but it's a fascinating environment with a very vulnerable group of patients who really deserve the best health care. And there's some evidence that good health care can reduce reoffending rates by giving some of the patients some self-esteem, which they've long lacked. What are the main differences then between your community and an outside community? 
But the community is very similar. Uh, the biggest difference is that 70% of our patients are drug users or drug dependent uh, and about 10% alcoholic and a very large concentration of mental health problems. It's said that up to 90% of patients in prison have a diagnosable health, mental health problem. Uh, so it's similar to an outside community, but more concentrated mental health problems, I would say. In terms of chronic pain, how does that affect prisoners? Chronic pain is a big problem for a lot of our patients. Uh, their opiate abuse may make them more susceptible to pain and may make them less able to cope with pain when it comes along. Some of the medications that are used in chronic pain are very desirable to drug users because of the other effects that they get, whether they're sedation or euphoria, or whether the drugs just make their prescribed opiates more effective. So chronic pain is a problem, but patients complain of chronic pain probably sometimes when they haven't really got pain, it's part of their drug-seeking behaviour. So it's a mixture of the two. How do you decide who is in the latter group rather than the real chronic pain user? Yeah, sure. Patients complain of nerve pain and nerve damage. If a genuine patient has nerve damage, there'll be some evidence of a cause for that, whether it's diabetes, whether it's a neurological problem, or whether there's some scarring from burns or surgery or injuries or whatever. Patients who are drug-seeking will tend to fabricate their uh, symptoms and they won't be anatomically logical. So in other words, they might complain of pains affecting areas that aren't supplied by the nerve that goes through the damaged area, if that makes sense. So non-anatomical pain distribution is uh, one thing that would make us think that this is drug seeking. And the other is patients who are genuine are grateful for the suggestions that their clinicians give them. Patients who are drug seeking have one drug in mind. They usually name it and they usually argue if it's not suggested. So if I were a drug abuser then, and you offered me some psychological approach? My experience and that of my colleagues is that that will usually end in an argument. That's right, yes. So let's concentrate on the people with genuine chronic pain. How do you treat them? I'd like to think that we treat them the same as I would treat such a patient outside the prison walls. The, the changes that we make are not because of imprisonment. It's crucial to understand that patients are entitled to equivalent health care. That may not be identical, but it's equivalent to the care that they would receive outside otherwise. So if somebody came to me with very good evidence of nerve damage causing chronic pain, then I would assess them by taking their history and listening to them, which can be helpful in itself. I would examine them looking for evidence to support the diagnosis and if necessary arrange tests that would help to confirm that. Nerve conduction studies is one example. Uh, they can show damage to nerves which will confirm beyond doubt the presence of neuropathic or nerve related pain. Then I'm very happy to treat people as the national guidelines suggest. The NICE guidelines from three or four years ago suggest some drug treatments, they suggest physical treatments, and they suggest some psychological treatments as well. And we would certainly look to go down that route. I think some of the programmes that you've done previously look as if they will be very helpful to our patients. So I'm going to suggest that we give them access to those on CD Unfortunately, most of our patients don't have access to the internet. I'm really glad to hear that our programmes are useful, but for prisoners there are certain constraints put on them that would make approaches that would, say, be used on me, psychological approaches, virtually impossible. I mean, pacing and things like depression, and things like, you know, what my GP would tell me to do, or what my pain management people would tell me to do, involve the outside world. Yes, 
it, it's certainly true to say that some aspects of psychological approaches may not be easily available to people in prison, but others will be. Cognitive behavioural therapy is already used for patients who suffer with anxiety, and through increasing access to psychological therapies, or IAPT, um, prisoners are able to access psychological therapies much more than ever they were before. So whilst I take your point that there are some things that prisoners won't be able to do, the, there are a lot of others that they can. And they've certainly got very good access to gymnasium facilities and physiotherapy, far better than I have. So overall, the holistic approach is going to be useful for prisoners, I think. What evidence is there that a healthy, pain-free prisoner will not go back to reoffend. Certainly prisoner patients who come in for the first time or the first few times are very often very low in their self-esteem. Uh, they haven't taken care of themselves. These patients don't access healthcare facilities readily outside, maybe because of fear of authority figures, uh, maybe because of chaotic lifestyles, meaning that appointments get missed. Coming into prison is a real opportunity to take charge of patients' health care. They can take charge of it themselves, take some personal responsibility, and through seeing their health improve in the prison setting, because they're accessing health care, they're eating well, hopefully their illegal drug use is considerably reduced, and they're getting support with any mental health problems that they have. And also the prisons these days are very good at helping with training, with employment skills, uh, with housing if people are on more than very short sentences. All of this will help to contribute to an increase in self-esteem. I always say to the young men who come into prison, if you don't have any self-respect, it's very difficult to respect other people. And if you don't respect other people, you won't uh, respect their stuff. So these guys will perceive nothing wrong with stealing and damaging and so on. By giving them some self-respect, they can develop respectful relationships with other people. And there's good evidence that that helps to reduce reoffending. So clearly sending someone out healthier than he came in whether it's in terms of pain, drug use, mental health, or all three, that's got to help in the rehabilitation of the offender and reduce reoffending for that individual. Dr. Ian Brew. Now, before we finish this edition of Airing Pain, I'll remind you that you can download all editions of Airing Pain from painconcern.org.uk. CD copies are also available direct from Pain Concern please do visit the website where you can find all sorts of essential information about pain management, including details of Pain Matters, our magazine that complements and expands on issues covered in airing pain. It's now also available as an enhanced digital download, so please do check it out at the Pain Concern website. Once again, it's painconcern.org.uk. And finally, in talking to Dr Ian Brew about those guidelines for treating prisoners with chronic pain, I was interested to know why a GP who could have opted to work in a much more conventional and presumably less stressful environment should have opted for one within the walls of Her Majesty's prisons. My mum and dad often say, what are you doing working in a place like that? Why don't you get a proper job out in a suburb somewhere? And I just think that it's so rewarding working with this very vulnerable group. A success for me is not seeing the patient again, which is quite bizarre for a GP. Um, most GPs go into primary care because of the lifelong relationship, the therapeutic relationship they can build up with people. I enjoy the therapeutic relationship with vulnerable people who can be helped to help themselves. And when I see someone outside the prison who hasn't been back for a few years, it, it makes the day worthwhile. It's really great to see people who are doing well. Um, we do get a bit of a skewed view because, of course, the people that we see are the ones who aren't ready to end their offending career. 
so we can sometimes feel that we're not doing much good but as I say one guy in the supermarket hello Dr Brew how are you doing oh, I haven't seen you for years I'll say it just makes the whole thing worthwhile <laughs>